I've listened to Welcome by the Arcadian Wild since it came out three months ago. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello everybody, and I say it every week, but this week it's a pun. Welcome back to Spin It, the record ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me is Connor. It took me too long to realize why that was a pun. <laughs> I mean, it's less of a pun and more like just me saying the name of the album in there. Yeah. It's probably misclassifying it to call it a pun, but I really don't know what else to say. An illusion? A reference? A play on words? Yeah. Play on words, which is how I would define a pun. I feel like most people would have been like, welcome back, pun intended. That's true. So I feel like I feel like pun's okay. Okay. We're getting wild this week. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Not too wild, though. No. I have a toga party to go to later. <laughs> Do you really? I feel like that's fake. <laughs> Gotta save my wildness for that. Okay. Yeah. Can't have just a boring toga party. I don't believe you've ever been to a toga party. I don't believe anyone is still throwing toga parties in... 2023 unironically you see uh well in 2023 probably i don't know i can't i can't speak to that yes you can you're getting invited to one but uh you would be wrong about me never being the one so you admit that you're not going to one tonight no <laughs> i don't know the evidence <laughs> the evidence you just presented seems to point to the contrary it's just because i don't know that uh people are throwing toga parties in 2023 doesn't mean that uh toga parties aren't happening that i might be attending oh, okay uh yeah sure what a technicality. Maybe it's a party of one. I know you're not a lawyer, but like, did you ever consider it? All the time. There was two careers that adults would, said I'd be good for as a child. Yeah. Lawyer and salesman. Mm, and you don't do either. And both require you to be good with words, which I think we now have like 123 episodes proving that they were all full of it. They were all wrong. <laughs> that means you'd be a good lawyer, <laughs> yeah. though, because you convinced them that you would be. Whoa. Uh-huh. Get lawyered. Yeah. Anyway, when I said getting wild, I just, I also meant that one was a pun, because we're talking about the Arcadian wild. So it's not really wild wild. Like, the band is wild. Oh, that's right. That's where the train derailed. Yeah. I was just trying to get us <laughs> back on track. The Arcadian wild is a band that I found out about... Back when you could still call them, I think, a local band, a Nashville local band, that is. But they've grown so far beyond the scope of that in such a short time. I don't think it's proper to call them a local band anymore. I don't think they're a Nashville band. They just started out here. I'm going to go out on a limb. It's a very sturdy limb, though. So I don't think it's the kind of going out on a limb that is tenuous. I don't think the limb will drop me. I don't think you've heard of the Arcadian Wild before. I'll give you this one. You got me. I gotcha. So good. I'm excited to bring you another totally new band. I just like the November-y kind of vibes of folk and Americana music. It just always puts me in a fall mood. Something about string instruments and tight vocal harmonies and just like the acoustic nature of it gets me autumnal. <laughs> okay then. Well, I mean, look at our track record. That's kind of where we've headed every autumn so far. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, since you've never heard of the Arcadian Wild, and some of you out there listening maybe have, and some of you maybe haven't, but I'm going to tell you all about it the same either way. We're equal opportunity educators here at Spin It. Heck yeah. And you shall learn. So the Arcadian Wild got its start a few years back. Guitarist Isaac Horn and mandolinist Lincoln Mick met when they were classmates and choir mates at Lipscomb University in the early 20-teens. Believe it or not, their taste in music wasn't always just folksy. They also really loved alt-rock, and they started playing music together. They started out in really small, intimate house shows around Nashville with some friends of mine actually in attendance from time to time, and they had help from a few other band members, notably a violinist, a female vocalist, sometimes an upright bassist, and Eric Coveney. In 2015, the Arcadian Wild put out their self-titled, pretty self-made debut album, and it was a hit. It picked up more than 50 million Spotify streams, which is a veritable ton <laughs> For a band playing such small, intimate shows, 50 million streams is astronomical. Their second record, A Finch in the Pantry, also was a quite strong contender for the subject of this episode. It debuted in the top 10 of the Billboard Bluegrass chart. Love that record, too. It was the first full-length release of theirs that I actually dove into. That was kind of my biggest entry point into the Arcadian Wild. But before that, I knew some of their singles that had preceded it from their self-titled album and stuff. Then, in early 2020, the third piece of the puzzle that is today's Arcadian Wild trio fell into place when fiddler Bailey Warren joined the band. 
and she has got it, right? It's downright impressive just to hear and watch her play. I've seen them live only once so far, subject to change as soon as they are back in town. <laughs> but, man, they're just all so musically astute. It's more than just raw talent, which they have in spades, but they also just have this innate sense of how to arrange and build a song from the ground up. To me, anyway, it hooks me so hard. <laughs> Their, their music is so compelling because of the way that they lay it out and arrange it and play it, I mean, pretty flawlessly live, too. During the pandemic, they wrote and recorded a brilliant four-track song cycle called Principium, maybe my favorite thing that they've ever put out. I love it. I actually, I have it on vinyl. Oh, cool. I know. It's, it's blue and beautiful. That, I guess you'd call it an EP, that hit number three on the Billboard Bluegrass charts. So, again... I feel like it's really doing them a disservice to call them a local band, even though all their shows still kind of maintain a degree of that trademark house show level intimacy that they've always had. I think they do a really good job of making their shows like personable and connecting with an audience, even though they've got this national audience. You know, they tour the far reaches of the country. It's amazing. And uh, in the ensuing years after Principium, they set out on the journey that was their third LP, the one we're talking about today. It's called Welcome. We're back with another episode of... Oh, wait. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yes, Welcome. If you missed my Welcome beforehand, here it is again. We're back with another episode. I've operated off of instinct there. Yeah, I feel like sometimes you do. We already established I don't know what I'm going to say before I say it, so in a way, everything with me is instinct. I know. It's always a new adventure for you. If you don't know what you're going to say, I sure don't know what you're going to say. Yeah, you know, the best way to keep my enemies guessing is to not know what I'm going to do myself. Who are your enemies? You know? Haters gonna hate. Okay, sure. <laughs> the haters, they'll never know what you're up to. Well, Welcome came out late July 2023. It is their trademark folk Americana kind of sound. A lot of stringed instruments, which maybe is predictable for me. I don't know. But, uh, but that's what it is. One thing I actually really love about them and their style, especially of recorded music, is they try and record everything like it's live. I mean, we talked about how Rush kind of wrote music to be played with a three-piece band the other week, right? And the Arcadian Wild is the same way. They write music that they can play live. And when they record it, you know, they could go in and do more takes and clean it up and like digitally alter it. So it's like perfect, right? Technically perfect. But they keep a lot of those little fumbles or slight imperfections in there. And it, I think- Cause they're lazy. No, not okay. at all. Not at all. You take that back. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That was a joke. No. I'm so sorry. They do it because it makes the song feel more real and human and authentic. And it's still great, right? It doesn't need all that excessive polish. To hold up to snuff. I don't know. I don't think I listen to a song that doesn't have mistakes in it and go, this doesn't sound real or human. I think you can have both. Well, you sure could have both. That's true. I think it's different for different kinds of music, right? If you're listening to like, I don't know, rap or pop music or even some rock music, you're not going to expect. Well, sure. Pop is overly processed, even if they're it's whatever. But like, you can hear a song that sounds fine but doesn't have mistakes, or at least not noticeable ones. Yeah, that's true. Just saying. I just, I like it a lot for their style, for their sound, for their for their energy. Mm. It's nice. And to speak more into the personal kind of atmosphere they try and cultivate at their shows, Isaac says, after our shows, we'll meet these people who come from totally different worlds and likely wouldn't agree on some pretty fundamental things. But for a couple of hours, they shared an experience together, and we want our music to invite people to do that, to be a little gentler with each other, to see that they may have more in common than they realize, and that the things that make them different are gifts. When you approach the world with an open heart like that, anything is possible. And that's a lot of the sentiment that they put into Welcome as an album. They wanted it to be, for lack of a better word, because there's not one, welcoming. You said that like you wanted me to have a reaction to it, but I don't. Oh, well, I mean, that's valid. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. You just, the way you were like, you ended that like you were ready for me to be like, wow, or something. Well, I'll know. just clip that and move it to that point and it'll be your reaction. I like it. <laughs> Do that. But leave this part in so that it feels more human, not because we're lazy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's welcome. Are the Arcadian Wild, they've also put out a collection of covers, including Everybody Wants to Rule the World and Carry On Wayward Son in their signature style, which are so cool. I really recommend Everybody Wants to Rule the World. That's such a good one. They're also currently touring all over the country, like I said, and they even made their own Grand Ole Opry debut 
back in October, just recently. Wow. Yeah, so they have played on the Grand Ole Opry as many times as George Strait. Wow. That fact was funny because the George Strait number is so unbelievably low. No, I got it. I said wow. A double wow. That's how that's how wow it was. Got it. Also, their name comes from, I mean, a place called the Arcadian Wilds, which is like a Greek kind of utopia from mythology, which I'm sure you knew. Sure is. You did a mythos class or something. I did a lot of Greek and Roman culture and mythology and stuff yeah. in college. Was, that was what I did for my fun classes between all the math. Mm-hmm. All the toga parties you go to don't count. You did real classes. Well, I did take toga class as well. So Toga party class. <laughs> No, not, no, 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 please. Though I guess we did have a toga party to celebrate the end of class, so in a way, yes. Oh. But, uh, like, when classes were over for the semester, we had a little toga party. But we just took, we just took toga class, where we learned all about togas. See, so I don't think toga class is real, but I also would totally believe that your, like, Greek mythology or Roman mythology class had a toga party at the end of class. I just live in a world of uncertainty every time you say something. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well... Let's be uncertain about more things together and get the mixtape on out here for fact or spin. But to say, yeah, uh, speaking of people who say things that leave us uncertain. <laughs> I know. This week will be interesting. I am so curious to see what the mixtapers found. Found some interesting stuff. Let's get them out oh, here. Let's. Oh, I'm I'm nervous. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. The mixtaper. Welcome back to the podcast. Did you find a lot of facts about the Arcadian Wild? T to the H to the M to the X taper. T H M to the mix taper. <laughs> so you... uh, oh, I forgot the E. You forgot a couple <laughs> things. T to the H to the E to the mix taper. Yeah, it's better. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear what facts you may have found or what lies you may tell, and I'll do my best to pick out the differences. Uh, they recreated a famous painting. Ooh. <laughs> We've had some painting facts in the past. What famous painting did they recreate? Thomas, I just realized I should have looked up how to pronounce this name. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thomas Cowperthwaite Ekins. Ekins. E. Akins? Probably Ekins or Akins. Probably Akins. We're going to go with Akins. Thomas Cowperthwaite. I already forgot how I was going to pronounce it. I don't know why you didn't just let that stand. You went back in and tried to pronounce it again. <laughs> I did. Oh, man. <laughs> By the time I got past Thomas, I'd forgotten everything we decided about how the last name went. Okay, well, what's the painting <laughs> called? We'll spare you another round of his name. Arcadia. It's called Arcadia. Oh, that's yeah. that's good. What's the painting, the original painting? What's the subject? What's it look like? Three people kind of in a field with like some, like up where like the tree line hits like a field. Mm -hmm. One's laying on a picnic blanket. One's laying playing like, what is that instrument called? Looks like little like bamboo shoots. Like a pan flute? Some sort of flute. A uh, pan flute. That's exactly what it is. It's a pan flute. And then another one standing over top of the other two playing what looks like a normal flute of some sort or maybe just a pan flute but at a weird angle <laughs> okay yeah interesting oh i don't know the painting not off the top of my head and you say they recreated it yeah oh i hate that this makes so much sense because obviously it's their namesake arcadian wild sure is could also be why i'm spinning it it sure could be can you tell me more about when the painting was made and where like what's the origin the painting was made in the 1880s okay and yes it's by american painter thomas I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go back there. I'm not going back there. <laughs> um, good old Tom painted this. Good old Tom painted this in the 1880s. Sure, American Tom. The atmosphere of it was described as ves vesper vespertinal mixture of sadness and tranquility. A sylvan realm far removed from the realities in 1883 Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay. Tom must have been from Philly. I think this is a spin. I think this is a spin. Yeah, yeah, I do. I It's notable. I mean, you mentioned the painting includes two woodwind instruments. They don't play wind instruments, and it's totally possible that they could have recreated the painting without them, but... No, they, they recreated them with it. Oh, with it? Oh, ooh. Oh, that yeah. makes me believe it less. Oh, but it's so believable. Fair enough. I'm just going to lock in spin and, uh, and deal with the consequences. This is... A good day for consequences. This is a spin. <laughs> All right. A good day for consequences for you. I really almost believed it. I mean, they've got uh, plenty of pictures in fields. Yeah. And, I mean, that sounds like it would fit right among them. <sighs> 
I really thought you were going to believe that one. No. It makes me a little sad. No, especially when you said the woodwinds thing. When you said they got pan flutes to like properly recreate it. Yeah, they could have just been recreating it with their pan flutes. Yeah. Or but... with pan flutes, you know. The... Sure. If you're going to recreate a photo, why would you not recreate it accurately, authentically? Well, because it doesn't authentically represent them or the music that they make, necessarily. <sighs> Which is such a big... They go to such great lengths to do it other times. It just didn't track that they wouldn't do it in that instance. Fair enough. Thomas Cowperthwaite Ekins. Oh, you did it the one time. <laughs> the fact's over, dude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, this is a real painting, though. Uh, it sounds like it. I feel like I should have seen it. Is it, like, super famous? I don't know. Eh, I don't know. No, I surely haven't seen this. Yeah. It's also a lot not what I thought it would be. Well, I said it was them on the edge of a field where there's a tree line. Oh, I know. One laying on a picnic table, one laying playing a pan flute, and one standing playing some sort of instrument. Yeah, sure. I just, I didn't... It's pretty much exactly what I described. I mean, yeah, (laughs) but that doesn't mean there wasn't room for my mind's eye to see it differently. Mm, There's a little more butt in that painting. Your mind's eye just sucks at seeing. Maybe. I need mind glasses. (laughs) Up next... Isaac is a wizard. Back on wizard facts, huh? The last two times you've said this, it's been Harry Potter related, and it's been because they were like cameos in Harry Potter. Radiohead did it. He was a cameo in... No, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, what's uh, what's Isaac's claim to wizardry? He's good at pinball. A pinball wizard? <laughs> wow, that's really good. I actually like that a lot. <laughs> good at pinball. How good at pinball? Good at it. I, I mean, self-proclaimed good at it. I mean, he could suck for all I really know. <laughs> okay, true. True enough. Why pinball? What's the appeal? He just, he likes pinball. I mean, what's not the love about pinball? You got balls? Surprising lack of pins. Yeah. But flashing lights, bumpers, little, whatever you call the little things that you hit the ball with, the little paddles. Flippers? Flippers, that's the word. Oh, okay. Does he have a favorite place to play pinball? Favorite pinball table? I need you to know. People who are big into pinball are really big into pinball. Uh Uh-huh. There's a website where you can go find the closest place near you that has a specific pinball machine. That's cool. I know. So if you, like, want to play a specific machine, you can find it. And it might only be 100 miles away, but they know where it is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He owns two of them, so maybe one of those is his favorite. Whoa, he owns two pinball tables? Sure does. Mm, That's cool. Posted a photo with him saying, I'm a pinball wizard. Hence the name of the fact. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to say this one is a toss-up. I'm surprised. I thought a lot of your facts would be a little more clear-cut this week. And a toss-up. I didn't know that was an option, but... Uh... I, I gave you no benefit of the doubt on the last fact. This time, I think I will give you the benefit of the doubt. I'll say this is a fact. Wait, what are you doubting? I doubt that it's true. Oh, oh But the enough. benefit of this <laughs> is that I'll say it's a fact on the off chance that it is. Sorry, you don't lock that in? Yeah. Okay, well, you didn't even ask what the what the pinball machines were. No, I didn't, and I'm not going to now because since I've locked in fact, it's really easy for you to lie about them and make this what maybe has previously heretofore been true into a lie. Well, that's why I asked you to lock it in first, so now it doesn't really matter what I said. Well, because I didn't ask. I just thought when... uh. When I said that there was a picture of them, you would your next thing would have just been, oh, yeah, like to try to catch me. You would have been like, oh, what games are in the picture? Oh, that would have been, yeah, not yeah. bad. Not bad. But I did ask what games were his favorite, and you said, I don't know. He has a picture, so probably those. Well, because I don't know they're his favorite. Well, okay. Is it true? I own lots of things that aren't my favorite. That may be. Is this fact going to be my favorite? I mean, I had a whole bunch of, like, stuff about this, like, nature-themed pinball machine. That's cool. That was all, all made up that... I was going to try to sell you one, and then you went and locked it in before I could say any of it, which means that this is a spin still. I know. <laughs> I thought it might be. I gave you the benefit of the doubt, though, for 50-50. Yeah. That's... I'm not surprised, but pinball's pretty cool. It is cool. I like pinball. You and I have been pinballing a couple times. Uh-huh. Or at least once. Do we, have we done it twice? I feel like we've only done it once. I feel like we've only done it once if you can't remember the word for flippers. My brain remembered them, but my lips didn't when they started speaking. <laughs> you had no flippers on your lippers. <laughs> no. Yeah. Do we want to get hot or godly first? Hot or godly? <laughs> it's like a new game. Yeah, new fist for the game show. Hot or godly? It's like a brand new mini game. Like a spinoff. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get hot first and then we can repent and clean it up afterwards. Bailey was almost burned at the stake. What? What is this, 1650? (laughs) What are you, almost burned at the stake? Yeah. I mean, is this a witch fact? 
technically. What's the technicality? I mean, it was inspired by witchcraft. What was? The original events. What what, what were the original events? What, what was the almost burning at the stake? She was recreating a scene of someone being burned by witchcraft. But she herself was not accused of witchcraft. For what? A school project. What kind of school project is having people burned at the stake? <laughs> I'm a little a little backwards on this. Uh, she's making a video presentation, recreation of a witch trial. Okay. For like what class? What's the subject? I assume English or history. Those are pretty much the only two you'd be covering witchcraft. Sure. <laughs> Science. <laughs> For physics. Yeah. <laughs> she weighs as much as a duck. What a weird fact. And what a bunch of non-details you've kind of given. Well, I have more details. Just, I really dug myself into a hole there with the answer to kinda. Yeah. About the witchcraftness. And I didn't really know how to get out of it. I don't know what to ask because I just, <laughs> I don't know. It's not like there's even thread to untangle. I'm just holding a ball of yarn with no ends to unravel right now. <laughs> well, here, I'll hand you an end. How did she almost get burned alive? That's a good question. And I feel like one I already asked, but how did she almost get burned alive? Oh, well, during the video recreation, you know, they wanted authenticity, you know? I like how you're going off about authenticity, but you started this by giving me the question to ask. And then when I asked it, you went, oh, like it was some new <laughs> new thing for you. Anyway, you go for authenticity in your video. Did I do that? I didn't even notice. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> As one does, you want a really authentic <laughs> video. It was authentic for me because I forgot I'd given you the end of the yarn. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wanted to be authentic. So, you know, they had her tied up to like a tree. I guess. And, you know, they were like, ah, oh, she's a witch. Burn her. And apparently, according to her retelling, she got a little singed. They got the flames a little too close. They lit a tree on fire? Mm. Uh, well, they didn't light the tree on fire. No. They lit her on fire. Well, not <laughs> on fire. They, you know, they, like, they, like, burned her close. They, they... <laughs> okay, no, I, like, let's just, I'm going to stop you right there. I don't think I believe this. I don't think this is true. I, okay, fair enough. I'm going to say this is another spin. Yeah, this is a spin. Yep. They did not light her clothes on fire while tied to a tree. No, I mean, that's a, I mean, pretty specific and outrageous story. I just, I don't know. I, I see this being a spin. Hmm. You know, your mind's eye needs glasses, but your regular eyes are good because this is a spin. <laughs> you see just okay. fine. I see just fine how fake that was. That's a good guess, though. Yeah. Well, I guess it's time to get godly. That's right. That was the hot fact. The hot spin. Well, joke's on you. The the godly fact was also a little hot. <laughs> is this another one about fire? Uh, well, Lincoln is a god. Okay. That's the fact title. Right. Of what? Fire. Of fire. <laughs> oh, they're both hot. So it really... Well, really, the sun. The sun, which is hot. Okay. And fiery. How do you mean? <laughs> he wrote a comic book. Ooh, really? Starring himself as a god. <laughs> Interesting. Well, what's it about? What's he do? Does he have sun powers? He brings fire to whatever race of people are on this weird planet that he's the god of. Aiden, A A Aiden, A A Y D E N. I'm gonna pronounce that Aiden. One five six. Okay, so like Prometheus. Yeah, pretty much, but more Celtic themed. Okay, interesting. What's inspired him to do this? Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't even know when he did it. Does it have a title? I, I just Aiden one five six. Oh, that's the title of the thing. Yeah. And you don't know when he did it. No, it just, this is on a Reddit post, so I have no supporting evidence that this is true. Oh. Outside of that Reddit post. Usually I try to find multiple sources, so, you know, playing with fire here. <laughs> oh, nice. Funny. <laughs> I think I'm going to say that this is also a spin. Ooh, went all spins this week? I think you might have gone all spins this week. I think you're saying you only have one source. Oops, sorry, only one source. I feel like that's a diversion because you have no sources and just made it up. Mm. Interesting, though, that it does mm. have a specific name. Aiden156? Yeah. A-Y-D-E-N. Yeah, I still don't believe it, though. I still think this is a spin. Okay, lock that in. I'll lock it in. The worst I can do is make you happy with a 50-50. Well, that would make you happy, too, right? That's what we're going for. Sure would. It's overjoyed. Yeah, so, you know, in order to be happy, you should really change your answer. No, see, I, I would uh. rather be over <laughs> overjoyed if I uh, maybe kept it a spin. Mm. Oh, I did try to warn you. You did. This is a true fact. No, it's not. It's a spin. Oh, wow. Usually, <laughs> usually you stop in the middle and change. You actually said the entire word fact that time. That was extra <laughs> dastardly. Yeah, extra dastardly. Just really wanted to make you regret not changing for half a second more. 
I did for a minute. I kept waiting for the stinger. I kept waiting for you to go, factually, it's a spin. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it never came until, I mean, the very end. Until it did. We got way past the point of no return before we returned, so. Better late than never, right? I mean, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't know why we had to be not on time at all. Uh, I did do something fun with this week of all spins, though. Did you now? Yeah. Well, let's see. We've got a painting. We've got a wizard. Yeah, we've got yep. a witch. We've got a god. We've got, like, mythical creatures. Mm, no. <laughs> okay. So we got the painting, right? Yeah. That was literally called Arcadia. Yeah. Which, you know, their name is the Arcadian Wild. Is it really? Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> then you had Pinball Wizard. Pinball, pinball Wizard. Machines, and an arcade. Oh, my goodness. Ian Wild. And then, you know, you one was born at the, the stake. You know, who, who was famously supposedly burned at the stake? Though historians debate it. Joan of Joan Arc. Joan of Arc. Cadian. <laughs> I mean, it's not really. I mean, you're the the Cadian. That's a stretch. Oh well, we're getting there. To finish the word Adian after Joan of Arc, we went to you know the gods. <laughs> that's the name. That's where you got the name. <laughs> yeah, Aiden one five six is one variant of Adian, the Celtic sun god. <laughs> well, huh? Yeah, you had Arc. Adian. <laughs> so, yeah, a bunch of arc related spins this time. Arc and Arcadia. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And I'm surprised I didn't pick up on something like that. Yeah, I just really played with different parts of the name. I couldn't play with Wild too well without that being afraid to give it away. Mm. So I just stuck with Arcadian and broke it up into different parts of the word. That was smart. And I'm a fool for not catching on. Well, Mixed Taper, it's been a good week. It's been an okay week. Could have been better. It could have. Could have been worse. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next week for our Thanksgiving special. You know, you're so mean to me. Oh, okay. Why? All I want to do is go 50-50 with you like we both agreed upon at the beginning of the year for the year of healing. I just want to heal with you. And here you are rooting against the 50-50, even after I got you such a nice presence back in Mixtober. It's true. I, I do cherish those. <laughs> next, taper, next week's our Thanksgiving special, so I'm expecting some interesting Thanksgiving kind of facts from you. We'll see. I am a turkey bird. Yeah. I live a turkey life. We're not doing that song still. Tell Connor. We're still not doing turkey bird. He's turned me on to it. Uh, it's a pretty good song. I'm sure you'd think that. Well, we'll see you next week for more facts and spins and fun. At least facts and spins. Fun TBD. Well, I mean, honestly, the fun is included all the time, and we never know. Like, this week there were spins and fun. No facts. Oh, that's true. The fun is really the only guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you listen to the Spin It podcast, you're guaranteed to have fun. That's a mixtaper guarantee. Heck yeah. And until then, yeah. All right. Welcome back, Connor. Oh, I am back. Let's talk about the album cover. Of welcome. It makes me hungry. It makes me hungry too. And it's also another reason we're doing it around Thanksgiving time. It makes me a bit lonely. Oh. <laughs> well then, I guess we could do it anytime. But most importantly. Yeah? It makes me jealous of that chandelier. Oh my gosh, right? What a beautiful chandelier. The photo, if you haven't seen it, or if you need a reminder. Or if you just want to listen to James uh, describe it. Oh yeah, that too. I think that covers pretty much everybody. It oughta. Or for some other reason, you wanted to hear this. There, now we're covered. Perfect. That's everybody. It's a bunch of people around a table being welcomed to a feast. Can you tell what they're eating? I want to know. I want to know if this was like an actual meal or like a staged photo. Well, I see rolls and I see what look like chicken legs and green beans and mashed potatoes, but it's probably turkey, right? Probably not chicken legs, but I think it's chicken. Kind of looks like a chicken leg. I definitely see green beans. I definitely see rolls. Yeah. I see what appears to be either rice or mashed potatoes. Mm-hmm. I see maybe cornbread or a mangled up like square roll. <laughs> mangled up square roll, sure. A lot of flowers. I see what something that looks like seaweed or broccoli. I'm gonna guess it's not seaweed. It could be. I don't want to rule it out entirely. That'd be foolish, but I see either Kool-Aid or red wine in the glasses. No other possibilities. No, nope, that's it. We just did a whole episode Blood. about Tang. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we went two different... Mixtober's over. Candles. Part of the ambiance. The ambiance. Yeah. The ambiance or the ambiance. That should cover <laughs> all the pronunciations. Yeah. It is very well lit. Very cozy. Very homey. Look at the one kid that's like trying to leave dinner. 
Or he doesn't even have a spot to sit. Look at all these people that don't have spots to sit to eat. They got to stand awkwardly in the back. Well, maybe they're like rotating. Maybe they already ate. And this is like the second wave. Yeah, but look at the back, right? The one mother's holding what looks like a baby who she's like, it's okay. Maybe we'll get some scraps if they don't eat it all. I didn't look like that kid would eat a ton of food either way. Like, I think they're forcing these people to watch them eat. I don't think that's what's happening here at all. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening nah, here. Okay, all these people are gathered together to enjoy this meal, and they, they're they a bit of exhibitionists, so they like to have people watch them while they eat. That's a hot take. <laughs> and they're like, welcome, come stand over here and watch us eat our feast. It's more like, welcome, come feast with us. You're kind of like halfway there. I think they're just rude. Didn't bother to... Look, there's even an empty seat right at the head of the table, and they <laughs> okay. could have put one at the uh, other end. <laughs> well, touche. I mean, you got me there. I think that's mostly an aesthetic choice. I mean, they're forcing those people to stand. Maybe they chose... You know, maybe they chose to stand. Look, the one kid on the left is like trying to run. Like, please let me out of here. I'm starving. We don't uh, usually do this in depth on the album cover, but there's a lot to see, a lot to notice. And it's like all the people with little kids. I mean, there's like three groups of people with little kids standing. Maybe they're looking for the kids table. Maybe there's a kids table. Yeah, just out of frame, like where we're standing. You in the back in the corner with a, what looks like a goatee. You must sit at the kids table. I'm also really impressed with the photographer's ability to not be seen in that giant mirror at the end of the table. <laughs> Very well done. Yeah, well, it's all about the angle. You notice it's the per the way the perspective is and everything. Mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing up in the reflection, not straight. A little bit. So it's clever. Bravo. Yeah. Let's talk about some music. Oh, that's right. We're a music podcast. That's right. Spin it. The album cover review podcast. Each week, we bring you another album art that we're going to just tear to shreds. And completely distort. We did kind of do Ella Fitzgerald dirty last week. We just said our album cover was yellow and it looked like pee. Well, you said that. You said that. Well, we did I say said that. that. I, feel like, I feel like you said that. The podcast's <laughs> official stance was that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm the only one allowed to give out unilateral official stances on this podcast. And that's my unilateral official stance. <laughs> I can't argue with that. The first track on Welcome is Lara. Laura. Laura. Layra. That should be all the ways you can pronounce it. <laughs> that should satisfy everybody. We're all about being welcoming. Lay Ray. There was another one. I oh, found one you're more. right. There's another one. It's not that. Anyway. Sorry to all the Lay Rays out there. If there's one <laughs> single solitary person that can prove to us that you've, at some point in your life, now or like always, have gone by Lay Ray, I don't know what we'll do, but it'll be significant. Might just have to send you a Spin It Lay Ray shirt. What'd you think of the songs? What'd you think just of the overall vibe in general? The overall vibe? <sighs> First track, expectations are, are maybe minimal. What do you got? Well, expectations were folksy. Sure. Simply because Spotify liked to show me an image of them standing in a field with their instruments <laughs> in a tree line that the mixtaper may or may not have drawn inspiration from. As a matter of fact, that may or may not have been the closest, like, that was the biggest stumbling block for me, was was that photo shoot. And I was like, oh, it would have been really easy for them to imitate that painting. But look, you'll notice they're all holding stringed instruments. Yeah, yeah. So I knew better. I got him. I won't let him get my head down. He doesn't know a thing about the rain clouds. He doesn't even know which way the wind's bound. So how could he know my name? Well, he knows my name because we employ him. Ba -da 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 anyway, that's the first verse. Anyway, I like the vocal rhythm. Ba -da 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 -da. Yeah. It's very bouncy. Their vocals are consistently great throughout this album and all of them. They are really good at harmony. And they talk about that, how... Sometimes when they get stuck on a song or a lyric or like want to figure out something to write, they go straight to the vocals. They just start singing together and figure out what works and build the song kind of around that bass, which has served them really well. And I think that's evident on some songs on this album that have a really good vocal structure to them, but maybe you're like not something you'd necessarily think of musically if you're holding an instrument. Like Big Sky Montana in a couple tracks is one that comes to mind. Mm. But Lara's great. It's all about a woman who's struggling. This song is, you know, a message of encouragement to her to uplift her and and to tell her not to worry about what people think. You know, in the morning, things could turn around for them. And they could be in your shoes. So you just gotta wear your heart on your sleeve. Really live your life. And do the best you can. You're carrying the fire. Don't forget now. Super encouraging song. It is. Then we get on to track two. Dopamine. Guess what? It's another phone song. 
Another phone song. Add it to our collection. And let me guess, this one's your favorite of the phone songs. Well, I was trying to go over in my head what we've already talked about. We did Look Up by the band Camino. Yep. We did Electric Circus by Bad Sons. Yep. There's been another one that we did, too. Yep. I think we've done three, now four, counting this one. I think Dopamine is the fourth phone bad song. We need to keep a list. I know. Oh, it might have been Coin. I think it might have been Coin. Is it Are We Alone? Your eyes are staring vacantly, but are you even listening at all? Tell me, would you rather be alone because you're checked out of the situation so much? I th I think that's it. I don't remember, and I'm not going to pretend to. Well... But <laughs> my favorite is still Electric Circus. Electric Circus is up there for me. Oh, I do think, lyrically... Electric Circus is probably my favorite or second favorite. I might have called Coin my favorite, if that's the one that it is, because I also really like that one. I like the music of Dopamine probably better than all but maybe Electric Circus of the others. And there's a lot of good lyrically here, too. I, I would call Dopamine maybe the second best. That's where I would probably put it, too. Yeah. I like what they do here. The structure of this song is fun because it builds on itself, mm -hmm. right? Lincoln starts in with that first bit, hit him with Dopamine to keep him looking every second. They're second guessing. That's great. Then Isaac comes in over that and with as like a panicked phone user, right? <laughs> like, what have I missed? Oh, no, I need to go check on everything and be constantly plugged in. And then Bailey comes in, also kind of like a, a removed from the situation, omniscient type voice, talking about how people are ever seeing, not perceiving, ever hearing, never understanding, like always connected, but never actually going deeper, just searching for that dopamine hit. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I really love the pre-chorus. Feel it slipping away. Just the way that all those kind of cacophonous parts that kind of grind against each other, but still like work together, right? Cogs in the machine. The way that those all blend and mesh into the pre-chorus. It's great. It gives the pre-chorus and the chorus a nice punch, nice extra wow factor. Ye. Ye? Are you saying yes without the S or are you trying to be Shakespearean? Uh, both. Okay. Well, ye art succeeding. <laughs> Thou art succeeding. That's not what you would say ye. I'm really enjoying the instrument choice as well so far yes oh i meant to talk about <laughs> especially I'm, i don't know if we're ready to move on to it but uh especially on the next track big sky montana i'm ready to move on to it but i want to talk about that too because so many of these songs are so so rhythmically inclined so almost like a clock ticking right like they are very poppy like they just yeah i don't know like a clock ticking is the best way i can say it and that's because of what they do with these instruments they don't use drums yeah they don't they just pluck their strings really the the beat is mainly driven by because you got the guitar the violin and the what's the third instrument the mandolin the mandolin i feel like the mandolin does a lot of the rhythmic timekeeping it does it's huge for that like you'll, you'll hear the mandolin going bump ba bump ba bump like a drum would yeah, and it helps too because the mandolin, if you strum it right, uh -huh. there's a nice little kind of sound that it makes. Yeah. And that is yep. huge for the rhythm. And not to mention some of these songs that have the upright bass on them, that is great for the rhythm too. Uh huh. And it just gives them, it really fills out the lower range of their sound when it does appear. Big Sky makes great use of the violin though. I love the little violin solos. Yeah. It's so interesting. And it's one of those songs where I just feel like this is a thing I'd never think to do musically. Just the way that it's structured, especially melodically. Well, that's why you're not a successful musician. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Probably part of it. But then, I mean, when you consider the fact that it's a vocals first kind of mentality, right? They build it around those melodies. Everything starts to come together. If it was easy to think of, everybody would be famous musicians. That's true. And when everyone's a famous musician... No one will be. Settle down, Syndrome. Have you been to Big Sky? Have you been to Montana? Uh, no, I haven't been anywhere. Okay, fair enough. I've been to, if you count, like, if you don't count just driving through a state, if you just count, like, actually going to the state and doing something in that state, I've only been to, like, probably, I think we did this one time. I think I was, like, barely in the double digits. Okay. But I have been to multiple countries. I've been to probably at least a quarter as many countries as I have states wow whoa <laughs> well because i've been to ireland england france and the united states that's four and i'm guessing i'm can you really say you've been to the united states i mean te technically you have okay so if not that's three and that's a quarter if you do if you count the united states then it's probably a third because i can't imagine i'm at more than 12 states fair enough i haven't been to big sky but i've been in the neighborhood ish yeah oh it's great there's really and you didn't stop for for dinner with big sky didn't even tell him that you were in the neighborhood no didn't have a side of bread rude I, 
I don't want to show up without a side of bread. That'd be even ruder. Yeah, that's so rude to not show up with a side of bread. How could the universe do this? The universe would never forgive you. That's such a deep cut joke. What was that, like episode three, five? Thirteen. Was, that was early. Thirteen. Thirteen. That's the baker's dozen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I looked long and hard, and I honestly think the sky was exactly the same size. It's a con. You think? Yeah, it's a tourist con. Mm. They can't just call it normal sky. No one would go. I mean, but you said you yourself you weren't there. Okay, touche. Maybe the sky gets bigger once you cross the city limit. Exactly. The area right outside the city limit isn't called Big Sky. Inside the city limit is called Big Sky. True. So you really have no way of knowing. I was just in Sky, Montana. Yeah, exactly. You're in normal Sky, Montana. Maybe even small Sky, Montana. Did it seem a little small? No, it just seemed normal. Well, it probably would look small after you've seen the Big Sky. I know. Everything looks small after you see Big Sky. Nothing's ever the same. Now, how does Big Sky, Montana compare to just Texas as a whole? Because everything's bigger in Texas. Including the sky. Yeah, that's true. Did Montana steal a bit of Texas's sky oh. and take it back to Montana? And that's why they have big sky? <laughs> Possibly. I think there's a conspiracy going on here. Well, we need to get to the bottom of. Yeah, we do. But first, we need to get to the bottom of the song. Huh? Sorry. Yeah, big sky. I love the imagery they use in this song. We've been talking about this one for a while. We started this one talking about, about instrumentation. And here we are talking about skies. I know. It felt like a natural progression. Most of it did. <laughs> Yeah, for the most part. The sweet grass dancing in the mountain air and the old ponderosa pines. It's so nice. But then what's even sweeter and even nicer is the relationship of this couple who's so devoted to each other that they'll tear the whole thing down, if you ask me. They'll eviscerate Big Sky. Dang. Wipe it off the face of the earth. Well, that's what it says. I mean, in implied terms. And it's so cool because they just get to share this beautiful life. It's so nice. Now, whenever I hear Big Sky, I can't help but think of, like, Big Pharma or, you know, big, just like... It's all a cover-up. Yeah. Big Sky. Big Sky. The conspiracy. They don't want you to know the truth. <laughs> it's not that kind of Big Sky. Uh, so, listen. Yeah? I, I kind of want to... I feel like I need to bring up Atlas here. Atlas? Because we're talking about how big the sky is? Yeah, well, and, and because you know, had to hold it up. Atlas carries the entire sky on his... On his shoulders, shoulders. exactly. You knew exactly where I was taking this, yeah. Well, no offense, <laughs> but it was a little obvious. Offense taken. Connor will remember this. Does this fall out? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, your relationship status with Connor has changed. <laughs> I'm losing reputation points. <sighs> Lincoln wrote Shoulders as a way to honor his own father, but he says that it functions kind of as an anthem to all kinds of father figures and family members in your life. Like Atlas. He actually took a lot of inspiration from Mr. Rogers and his belief that everyone had people who loved them into being. Oh, his neighbor. Yeah, my neighbor too. Dude, do we live two doors down from the Arcadian Wild? It's us, and then it's Mr. Rogers, and then it's the Arcadian Wild. He was, he was like, welcome to the neighborhood, and it was Big Sky, and you didn't stop by because you didn't tell him you were coming. You didn't tell him you were in the neighborhood. No, no, I didn't. Mr. Rogers will remember this. <laughs> <laughs> Man, your reputation is falling with everybody. I feel like Mr. Rogers had good rapport with everyone. Yeah. Anyway, what do you think about Shoulders? Yeah. I think it's a pretty song. It's pretty. It's pretty level is diminished. After I've seen Big Sky, you're right. After I've seen Big Sky Montana. Everything else is small. This one doesn't quite feel the same. Everything seems a little smaller. Small little shoulders. But Shoulders is supposed to be a smaller song, a focused song. Hmm. You know, a song dedicated to one person. You're not examining the vast sweeping lands. Well, one person and just like all father figures ever. One person and all the fathers. Yeah. I'm standing on your shoulders. You turn my green to golden. I like it. I like it a lot too. And there's this just awesome degree of admiration. Whenever I look in your eyes, I always find the man I want to be. How great. Now I one I liked a little more than shoulders little bird really i think i'm in the opposite camp really yeah i enjoyed little bird so it reminds me a bit of lay ray okay lara yeah in the sense that it's like got the the uh, more drawn out folksy instrumentals that they put over top with the fast-paced lyrics you know they're like da 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 you know the instruments are being like ba ba bum ba bum and uh i like that i like that effect yeah, I can get behind that. And then they also do a big, they do a nice big instrumental section towards the end of the song that I also really enjoyed. It is, it is a good instrumental. I don't know. I, I still lean towards shoulders. One thing you might not know is that Little Bird is actually the origin story of a popular Sesame Street character. Really? Medium Bird? Elmo. No, <laughs> that's a joke. I made it all up. It's all a lie. Uh, <laughs> Elmo, that's so funny. It was funny. Don't patronize me. Little Bird is cool because it evolves from 
this simple little moment. I don't know. I picture you sitting on your front porch and a little bird comes up and, you know, it's just singing and then it flies away. And then all of a sudden we get a little. What's it singing? Is it Smash Mouth? No. Can it be? It's singing la da 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 da. It kind of sounds like Smash Mouth. <laughs> Does it? I guess. Birds aren't real. It's a conspiracy that Big Sky <laughs> wants you to believe. <laughs> oh, man. That little bird. It's on your shoulders. It's just a Big Sky drone. Sent to fill you with dopamine. Yeah, but he gets existential when the bird flies away. You know, tell me a story, one you've never told, because I want to know how you sing. I want to know how you dream. I want to take that energy and emulate it. It's super sweet. Something. It, they get a little more specific with it, too. Little bird is track five. Track six is a specific little bird, a sparrow. Captain Jock Sparrow. No? No. This song does not evoke that at all. No sweeping organs? No. Sparrow is a little bit of a thematic pivot. So far in the album, everything's been going great, right? We've been encouraging people. We've been, you know, plugging into our real lives and unplugging from technology. We've been in the beauty of nature. We've been sending love to our heroes and the people we respect and admire. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff. And then Sparrow hits and it's like, man, I'm defeated and I'm burdened. And life has been so hard. You don't want to know how bad it's been. I had no idea it was going to be this difficult. What a, what a, I mean, pump the brakes, you know? Yep. But it doesn't sound like a sad song. They still find a way to guitar it into happiness. I don't know. It kind of does compared to everything else. Well, comparatively, yeah, that's true. You know what they say, though? Comparison is the thief of joy. It's not relevant to this situation, but they do say it. Sparrow is close to, the, if I'm ranking the album in tracks, you know, doing track by track rankings, Sparrow is closer to the bottom for me. Really? Personally, yes. I felt like on my one listen that I just didn't appreciate Sparrow enough, but maybe I appreciated it just enough. Oh, well, maybe you didn't though. Maybe it's worth another try because there are a lot of unique aspects of Sparrow that don't necessarily come up as prominently in other songs. Yeah, like I got to the end of it and I was like, man, if I had like more time to really get into this song, learn the lyrics, you know, hear it a few times, I felt felt like it could rise on my favorites list from this album. Oh, a sleeper track. But... I don't know, if you're saying it's towards the bottom for you, maybe that's where it'll stay for me, because, you know, if I only listen to this song, it would rise, but, you know, if I listen to the whole album, maybe the rest of them will rise too, and it'll stay in the same spot. Yeah, I mean, once you have really listened to Big Sky, everything else seems a little smaller. Yeah, little baby sparrow sitting in the corner. It's just a little bird sitting in the corner. <laughs> that's right. Wow, we're on it. This is a great album for transitions. Corner's up next. Instantly was intrigued. Instantly. By that soft start with the violin coming in kind of quiet and slowly crescendoing up. Awesome. It is instantly intriguing. I was instantly like pulled in like, oh, what, what am I hearing here? Yeah, such a pretty melody. This is in the same exact vein as Shoulders, but it kind of expands the scope a little bit from specifically like father figures into all kinds of people who are in your corner, who have your back. People who push you forward and are standing in your corner. Yeah, like mothers. And brothers. Like mothers and, and brothers and, and sisters and friends. Enemies that motivate you. Enemies. I was about to say enemies. But I guess they're not really in your corner. And you gotta fight your way out, you know, trapped in a corner. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting take on this song, but it probably just includes all kinds of people. Yeah. With all kinds of motivations. It's just such a pretty song. It is. I like the vocals. It's very um pretty, his higher range. Gentle. This is a gentle song. Gentle, yes. It's a gentle corner. Mm -hmm. Not sharp. That's right. It's not a sharp corner. <laughs> the lyrics describe this chaos, right? This storm that's raging around him when he wakes up. But he's able to remain calm and the world feels gentle because of these people in his corner carrying him through, helping him stay afloat. I like this one. And even in verse 2. Verse 2, the world's ending, the house is on fire, and so is this person that's in his corner. But they're not worried about themselves. They're throwing water on him to keep him safe. You know, it's very self-sacrificial, like supreme care, I guess, for his well-being. It's awesome. I like Corner a lot. Yeah, you know, makes me want three more of them. That's right, four corners. You could have all four. You know what doesn't have all four corners? Go ahead. 
Cherry Gardens. Is that what that means in English? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the next track, track eight. Why is it always track eight? So, you know, on Kaleo, track eight was Vori Vaga Sklogi <laughs> that was in Icelandic. Okay, there's something that you say is like, why is it always track seven, too? Is track seven where there's usually a drop-off if there's going to be a drop-off? I forget there was something not that recent that you were like, it's always track seven that... No, I think one thing that we've said in the past is that if a title track doesn't start, end, or is track two, it's usually track seven. Yeah. I feel like we've encountered that, but it hasn't been recent. And this one's not even in it at all. There is no title track. No, it's true. Uh, but this song, track eight, I just, I've never looked up a pronunciation. I'm so sorry. I don't speak Scottish Gaelic, which is the language that it is. Go ahead. It's probably something like Garod Seelock. Seelock? 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 That should cover everybody. <laughs> But yeah, it's Cherry Garden. It's an instrumental. So we don't have to worry too much about other words we can't pronounce. There are none. You don't know how badly I want to take this as my honorable mention. Simply because it's a Celtic, Scottish, whatever, instrumental. Is the fact <laughs> that you can't pronounce it hindering you from taking it in any way? Is that like a deterrent? No. You, you know I'm not afraid to mispronounce somebody, uh, something. Well, I mean, take it if you want. I really love this instrumental i do too it goes through a couple different movements that i really enjoy none of them really have the shape of like a verse or a chorus but it definitely gives you the good sense of progression and growth as we move through the song very much like a cherry garden yeah it grows it grows cherries yeah that is why it's called that also do cherries do cherries grow in a garden they're like a tree fruit don't cherries grow in like is there a cherry equivalent of an orchard? Is it an orchard? I feel like it'd be an orchard because it's a cherry tree, right? Trees are usually in orchards. But are orchards just a type of garden? That's what I'm wondering. Are orchards just for apples? No, because you can have... Oh, no. See, an orchard is an area of land devoted to the cultivation of fruit or nut trees. Yeah. So it would be a cherry orchard. But can an orchard be a garden? So yeah, it says here, orchards are also sometimes a feature of large gardens. So it seems like they can be like a subset of a garden. But this whole garden is just an orchard. The Venn diagram is a circle in this case. Yeah. I don't think I eat enough cherries, like as a fruit. I eat a lot of cherry flavored things. I feel like cherry flavor is way more common in my life than cherries. Yeah, or like not even like artificially cherry flavored things, just like... Like cherry pie, right? Well, I feel like the only thing that's real cherry flavored is a cherry. Well, no, I'm just saying like cherry pie. That's got cherries in it, right? Yeah. It's not artificial. I've always thought cherry pie was a little overrated. Yeah, but of the pies, you got... Oh, don't start naming pies. Hot take, especially around Thanksgiving time. Not the biggest fan of pumpkin pie. Whoa! Uh -huh. That's you're confessing this on a Thanksgiving episode? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, man. Like, I literally just today, as of recording this... Today, we had to turn in, you know, what pies we wanted. Work always gets us pies for Thanksgiving. And our choices were pumpkin, cherry, apple, and uh, pecan or pecan or pecan. That should cover all of them. That should cover yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went with cherry. You went with a cherry pie. Well, yeah, because we'll probably have pumpkin roll. And so you don't want pumpkin roll and pumpkin pie. Speak for yourself. I'm actually a big fan of the cream pies, which pumpkin pie is closer to, but I just don't like the consistency is off. For me with pumpkin pie is the issue. Mm. Whereas I'm a big fan of like banana cream, key lime. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of those kind of pies. So you need your pie to either be like super firm or super goop. Yeah. None of this pumpkin pie, semi-solid in the middle. Really, I'm just more of a cake person also. Like I'll take a slice of cake over almost any pie unless it's a dessert pie like a chocolate pie right i feel like most pies are dessert pies i don't know in a way anyway not a big fan anyway. of i was going somewhere with this oh oh i do cherry pies right so those have cherries in them <laughs> yeah walk it back i do maraschino cherries and ice cream all the time love maraschino cherries big fan yeah they probably do the majority of the legwork for the pr image of a cherry to me maraschino really pulling the weight can you name any other cherry influences on you no and that's why i think they're carrying the majority of the weight yeah <laughs> the fact that i know of them specifically and they're just very tasty they sure are you know just pastries in general you know like cupcakes and stuff sometimes they put a little cherry on top 
I get a lot of my cherries in desserts. Not so much in like a healthy fruit way. Well, the cherry is the fruit that makes it healthy. That's true. I did have a cherry smoothie last week that had actual cherries in it that I blended up with milk and spinach and some other stuff. It was healthy. Yeah, but at what cost? Probably waking up my neighbors at 6 a.m. when I was running my blender. <laughs> well, you know, what are you going to do? Can't go smoothie Some people like the sound of blenders. We're in the hot chocolate season now, though. So the neighbors can rest. We've talked for a good long time about this instrumental without any words. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Lift your head up. Okay. What kind of a bad transition was that? <laughs> we were doing so well, uh, except for the cherry tree thing. Cherry Garden kind of wrecked us a little bit. It's a free-for-all. Well, you, you started that by asking if a cherries were in a garden or not, and that really just took us down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Let's lift our heads to lift my head. This song feels fun but is it fun it kind of tells this like fairy tale story yeah it's fun i have a lot of fun with it okay it feels like an old folk song you know someone's looking for their queen and prancing around the land saying have you seen this fair maid you know you'd recognize her by her ocean blue eyes never will i rest till i see my queen beneath the willow tree it's got such a unique lyrical style that i really like feels like they're kind of experimenting with this new way to tell a story yeah i'm struggling to remember this one a little bit to be honest with you oh no did you lose it is this the one that had the the chorus that was like a higher pitched uh harmony yes that's the one yeah never will i rest till i see my queen that's the one it's very higher up and i think it's less of a chorus and more of like a Kind of like a bridge that gets repeated almost in terms of its function. Because it's really just such a hard musical pivot. And the verse is really the main driving force of the song. Which is what surprises me that you maybe couldn't remember it. Because the melody gets repeated so many times and it's already so hooky. Yeah, I don't know. It's a cute song. It's a fun song. And for me, for some of us, it's a memorable song. Mm. There's two kinds of people. The people that remember <laughs> Lift My Head <laughs> and the people that don't. I was going to say there was two kinds of songs, memorable ones and forgettable ones, but I like yours better. Oh, good. Well, we'll go with that one since I already said it. I like the boom, 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 boom. This is where that bass comes in that you were talking about. Big time. On two kinds? Heck yeah. And this reminded me of that quote from, I mean, I said it earlier in the episode, how everybody comes to their shows from all different walks of life, from all different, you know, states of being and backgrounds and situations. And then they just get to share this experience. You know, they realize the things that make us different are strengths. And everyone gets to participate in music, in this. So both kinds of people can put aside their differences. Are you deathly allergic to change? Great question. I'm deathly allergic to ragweed. Oh, what? <laughs> Learned that the hard way all week. What's a ragweed? It's a weed. It grows and then it pollinates. And when its pollen gets into my nose instead of on a bee like it belongs, it makes me sneeze. On a bee's butt where it belongs? Yeah. A little bee butt pollen? That's right. Up your nose? No, it's not bee butt pollen. That's the problem. Anyway, no, I'm not deathly allergic to change. <laughs> Oh. I don't like change, but I don't mind it. Yeah, most people don't. Half of my job is convincing people to accept change. I'm kind of a salesman in that way. Yeah, see, so there's two kinds of people. You're the maraschino cherry of the workplace. <laughs> I was taking us back to a conversation from, I believe, the first half. Did I not talk about how people, when I was growing up, said I'd be a lawyer or a salesman? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you did. So, in a way, the people who said I would be a salesman were right. I guess so. It's really interesting. Do you think there are two kinds of people, or do you think... I think there are billions of kinds of people. Everybody's unique. That's true. It's that's not really a kind of people. That's just... Individualism and all that jazz. All that jazz. But this is a folk album, so enough of that. All that folk. All those folk. All those, all those folks. Out there. <laughs> billions of them. It's interesting because the hook of the song kind of is that. You know, maybe sometimes it feels like there are two different kinds of people. Like there's no in-betweens. Like we're all diametrically opposed to each other on everything. And we're never going to find that middle ground. But the truth of the matter is we're one people, not two. You know, we all live in the same places and we all have the same problems and it's a whole thing two kinds is cool i think the bass makes this one a lot different you're right it's really the v feature of two kinds yeah but i also do like how when they do deliver that hook about how everyone's the same the harmonies stop and they all sing it in unison because they're together like all kinds of people you know a song i overlook a lot but i really shouldn't fable of the times fable of the times every time it starts musically i'm like heck yes like this is spot on i love it it's got the guitar that's tuned funny so it rings out really well it's got the violin 
that violins the melody up there. It's great. The lyrics are intriguing. The song moves really quickly. Honestly, at 319, it's like, feels short. But I really like the fable of the times. It's just about how we've kind of like bought into so many lies. You know, so many things that culture feeds us. We've got a foot on the pedal and one in our mouth. You know, we're flooring it and we're really making mistakes the whole way. We're saying the wrong things, doing the wrong things. We're just making mistake after mistake, collectively. Reveling in sanctimony, blinded by the beam in our own eye. And either we're ignorant of it, or we're staring it right in the face and ignoring it. And that's kind of like the fable of the times. Fable of the times is cool. It's a situation where, you know, they had two kinds of people in the last one. You just talked about individualism and billions of kinds of folks. This song is the same thing where everyone's kind of insulated in their own reality, living life their own way, and just missing so much of it because of that. Snap out of the fantasy. Snap out of it. Yep. Well... I can't believe this is the end. Not the end of the episode. The end of the album. Not even really the end of the album. We still got three minutes and 15 seconds. We still got the end. <laughs> it's true. I love the end. Wow. What a great way to close this album. It's the beginning of the end. Yeah, this is the beginning <laughs> of the end. <laughs> I love that it starts out with the chorus. You know, it tells us everything the song's about right away. It's high energy. It's a lot of fun. And there's something that always gets me about the way they place that instrumental hit, that guitar strum. Because it's just boom, and then it cuts out. I can't believe this is the end. I hope that it would last a little bit longer. And just the way that they put that guitar right before longer. I like that. Smart rhythmical decision. Very smart. Really enjoyable. And, you know, it could be about all kinds of goodbyes. Ultimately, it's about kind of a see you later situation where, you know, this is just goodbye for now. This is the end. And when we come back next time, we're going to raise a holy ruckus. We're going to be louder and happier and better than ever. Next time we vacation in Big Sky. Yeah, next time we vacation in Big Sky or host a giant Thanksgiving dinner around our table or our living room if you don't get a seat. Yeah. Next time we get invited to come watch a family eat Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Next time we go cherry picking in the cherry garden. Ooh. All the things. Just, you know, this won't last forever. The separation is impermanent. And we'll be able to party again soon. It's awesome. And I love the way that the end ends. Where they cut off on, I hoped it would last. Because it leaves you wanting more. It leaves you kind of kind of shocked at the way that you've just been tossed out of the end of the song. And the whole record. One of my favorites on this album. Tempting. Tempting to make it my playlist pick. But are you? I don't know. Let's get into Final Spin and find out. Let's find out. Heck yeah. Let's talk some scores. Their music is so cool. It is such a unique blend. You know, I, I've never really thought of it as bluegrass music, but they have topped bluegrass charts. Or not topped, but like performed well on bluegrass charts, you know? Sure. And I really like this Americana style. I mean, it says right here in their description on Spotify, combining elements of progressive bluegrass, folk, and formal vocal music. I know. I really like... A lot of their musical decisions. Almost every song on this album is a memorable melody. And it always just hits home. Music lands really well. Vocal harmonies are awesome. Great writing. 87. Given that an 87. Lyrics. Intriguing. A lot of personality to each of these songs. I like that they're not afraid to experiment. You know, if they want to write a phone song, they can. If they want to write a song about the rolling hills in Big Sky, Montana, they can. If they want to write a song about I'm on a quest to find my queen, they can. If they want to write a tribute to their loved ones and their family, they can. And it all is very seamless. 86. Like the lyrics a lot. Instruments and production. Holy crap. Obviously, a highlight not only of this record, but just of this band in general. One of the reasons I really love them and have been drawn to them. And it's not even so much a production thing, right? Because it's just how they play. They're just so good and excellent live. If you have the chance to see the Arcadian Wild live, you gotta try. You gotta go do it. 92 on instruments and production. Stellar. And the overall vibe, what do, I mean, again, it's the only adjective that feels apt. Welcoming. What a welcoming album. It's so cozy, so acoustic, so accessible to everyone, I think, regardless of what your musical tastes are, you'll probably find something in here that you like. Give it an 88. Yeah, you know, this album's got something that, that'll cover everybody. Yeah, it will. So it's overall score for Welcome by the Arcadian Wild. It's an 88.4, which lands it at number 146 on my ranking list. Top 150, it's tied with but just above Damn by Kendrick Lamar from episode 72. Whoa. <laughs> and slightly below Montero by Lil Nas X. Ooh. 
which was episode 46. So it's an outlier between two really wild ones. Yeah. I don't think this album shares much with either of those records. No. But here it sits. But that's me. That's my thoughts. I'm ready to hear some of your scores and thoughts and ideas and picks. Oh, you want to hear them now? Yeah, I said I can't wait. And that kind of implied that I didn't want to wait. Sorry, I should have been more clear. Oh. <laughs> I liked this album. It's been a minute since you've given me one who I'd never even heard of. That was the goal with this one. I knew it would be one you didn't know at all. Come in totally cold, totally blind. And you know, you're still chasing that high of Dua Lipa. I really am. All the way back on episode five. I gave you such good stuff right out of the gate, and I've never lived up to it since. Yeah, the, what's, the, what's the closest you've come is, uh... I mean, albums that I picked that you wouldn't have picked... I didn't, like, know at all. Is Dua Lipa, Lights is as close as I've come. Yeah, Lights is as close as you've come. It was a big triumph for me. 70-some episodes later. It was actually 69 episodes after Dua Lipa. Oh. And here we sit, some and... 50 episodes after that. <laughs> and, I mean, you got Sufjan Stevens at 84 there in the nines. He was a good one. Coheed at episode 59. I mean, you don't have anything, like, in the triple digits that... I mean, we've not been in the triple digits for that long, I guess, but... No, but long enough that I... I don't know. I'd like to bring you something totally new that's a winner. Mm. It's encouraging that you're looking at nines. Do you want it to beat or not be Dua Lipa. Like, do you want to dethrone the queen? I would love if this dethroned the queen. I mean, it's the year of healing. Really? That means I'm pushing past previously established boundaries and high water marks. Yeah, but can we... Is it truly healing if we have to tear down somebody else to do it? Or I just feel like it's like <laughs> setting a new standard for the future of the podcast. This becomes a new mm. benchmark, if that's the case. If that's really a thing you're talking about. New year, new benchmark, new podcast? Look, I'm not convinced that, you know, we're having this conversation and you're going to give it like a seven. What? Wait, what? That's very, it, it would be a you thing to do. To talk about where in the nines, how high should I go? Ooh, do you want it to go here? And then be like, well, tough. And then put it somewhere totally different. Yeah, you know me too well. Uh <laughs> yeah? Uh-oh. Yeah, this does not get a nine. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I was a little optimistic, but it would be cool. It would be great. It would be cool. But you don't know me well enough because this does get an eight out of ten. Okay, solid. I kind of thought this might be a nine. You're not a string instrument guy. Yeah. That's really the problem. No, I, I actually think, I, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I am a huge fan of horns. Everybody knows that. Let's listen to this podcast. Yeah. But I'm also a huge fan. I'm just a huge fan of instrumentals, right? I don't care. Mm. String. Uh, I mean, Woodwind's not the biggest fan of. I mean, but strings. Well, yeah. Horns. Right. They're all great. Okay. But then you're making my case here for like, I thought this would be, a, it's a strong instrumental album. Strong harmony album. It is. Sure is. I just don't think it's nines. Like looking at my nines. It is interesting because if it did enter a nine, it'd be down there near Montero, which is also near which where is you where are. I put it. Yeah, weird. You have it. You have it below Montero. In in order for me to put it below Montero, it either has to rank at the like very bottom of my nines or the top of my eights. And I think I'm making it my new top eight. Oh, I just don't think it quite squeezes into the nines. A new top eight. Awesome. Dethroning yeah. Eric Church. Yeah. I just don't think I want to give it a nine. Hey, fair enough. I still consider, I mean, I'm having a record year. Eric Church might not be anymore, but I still am. We're healing. As for my unit, this one gets eight units that'll cover everybody. Oh, <laughs> hey, that's good. Uh, <laughs> that'll be good for everyone. Everyone will like that. Everybody will like a, this unit. We'll cover everyone. So now that the easy part's out of the way, we got to do the hard part. Well, I haven't given my top three yet. That's Please, part of the on. hard part. Don't worry. Oh, is it part of the hard part? Yeah, okay. I definitely didn't try to just steamroll that. I was including that. Yeah, it feels like you did. No. Well, <laughs> we don't need to talk about it. My top three. Some interesting snubs. Uh-oh. Yeah. We've discussed my process for picking top threes if i like a song well enough to put in my top three it gets down and then if something later in the album beats it it gets replaced yeah so usually your top three you would think that would tend to make it very back heavy because you'd replace all the earlier things not necessarily because if i don't like the back stuff as much then the front stuff stays true but uh this one there were some interesting snubs where things got knocked off that i thought weren't gonna be beatable okay that's curious you do get all your picks this week by the way you are free i yep sure do my top three in album order. Lay Ray. Okay. Big Sky. Whoa. Noticeable snub for dopamine. 
I don't know if it's noticeable. Well, it's the Spotify fan favorite. The People's Champion yeah. has decided it's not worth his top three. Yeah. But Big Sky is a great pick. We talked about it like 20 times. Another noticeable jump here from Big Sky down to corner. Ooh, I was thinking you would say that. So you, in terms of like the tribute homage songs, you were in the corner of corner and not on the shoulder of shoulders? Correct. Okay. Actually, I was on the sho shoulders of corner, not oh. the corner of shoulders. Got it. Uh, well, that's not confusing at all, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, honorable mention and my playlist pick, Cherry Garden. Whoa! <laughs> it, you took it as a playlist pick. Really? On an album so full of vocal harmony? I think... We don't have enough instrumental representation on the playlist. Okay, touche. And we definitely don't have enough Celtic, Scottish, whatever you want to call it, instrumentals on the playlist. So, okay. Big fan. Big fan of the Cherry Garden. That's why we talked about cherries so much. Now, what are you taking for the playlist? Yeah, I guess that leaves me open. There's no negotiating this time, so I can just take whatever I want. And no, like, game of chicken for who's going to cave. <laughs> no, game of little bird. Game of sparrow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going back and forth between Big Sky Montana and the end right now. You did say you kind of wanted to take the end. I did and do. Kind of. Of course. I'm biased towards Big Sky. It was in my top three. but mm. Mm. I think because Cherry Garden is so upbeat the way that it is, mm. it's going to push me towards Big Sky Montana so we more accurately cover the breadth of the album. The End is great, but it's also an upbeat song. Yeah. And this album has so many wonderful, slower, softer, gentler parts that I think Big Sky encompasses really well. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened with my top three, too, is I literally legitimately had the first four written down as my top three in carnival mention yeah <laughs> and then i hit corner and i was like "Ooh, i like this better as like a ballad yeah and so i knocked out shoulders and then we hit cherry garden and i was like this is great whoa and then i was like I dopamine already kind of sounds a bit of a hybrid between big sky and lay ray so i was like i'll oh, just bump that one out and put in cherry garden and then i've got like the instrumentals the the ballads the smoother instrumentals with the faster tempo lyrics mm -hmm. kind of kind of covered it all yeah your top through i mean it really gets around you do once again they'll get to take a quarter of the album so it's easier to get around i just get to do one representative pick all right, listen when we were establishing the, the rules of this podcast way back in episode one, you did that to yourself. You made that unilateral decision. Yeah, I unilaterally made you do that to yourself. <laughs> right. Well, I can't believe this is the end. I thought it would last a little bit longer. We did everything? Yeah, we did. I mean, it was only three minutes and 15 seconds. It's true. Well, come back next week when we'll raise a holy ruckus to the heights. And we've got another thanksgiving -y album folksy kinda americana kinda very much in the same vein of this and i'm so excited to talk about it next week's officially the thanksgiving episode right yes. i know we kind of called this one the thanksgiving episode with all the pie talk no this is a run-up yeah all the pie talk you're right it kind of made its way there naturally organically somehow yeah but next week properly thanksgiving special Maybe it won't be special. Maybe it will. Only one way to find out. And that's the tune in. Darn right. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, including right here. And you can find us on Twitter, at SpinItPod, on Instagram, at SpinItPod Official, and at our website, www. I could probably stop saying www. That's like implied and known. Nah, I think it's part of it. It's part of the charm. Do you think? I think so. I like it. www.spinitpod.com. It's got, it's got a good cadence to it. Yeah, but sometimes I mess up and only say two W's. What if people go to the wrong website? Yeah, well, congratulations to www.spinitpod.com. They've earned it. They've earned our accidental traffic. <laughs> yeah, no, www.spinitpod.com. It's honestly the best place to find us. All sorts of good stuff. Blooper reels, bonus content, B-side, extended versions of certain episodes. The works. The works. So, yeah, tell a friend who doesn't eat enough cherries about this podcast, and we'll see you next week. Until then, keep, keep spinning. spinning. What time does this toka party of yours start? Are you going to be late? Party already started. The mixtape was hosting. Oh, yes. Sorry. It's a toka party in your own house. This whole time I've been worried about... What the mixtape are. Is it just the two of you? Well, three of us. The gopher. Yeah. So you're going to sit around in your house in togas all night. Frank might be there. Wow. You know, I can't help but notice that I didn't get an invite. Uh, let me ask you this here. Mixtaper, where's James's invite? Uh, hey, it's me, the Mixtaper here. Uh, it must have got lost in the mail. Definitely didn't forget to mail 
your invite. Hmm. Well, enjoy your toga party. I mean, I gave it to the snail. Maybe he's just not there. <laughs> okay.